The Israeli Foundation has been a key funder of this research project over the past two years, and the Family Support Institute of BC is a frontline community NGO working with the BC project. I'm going to turn things over now to our moderator for this panel, Wendy Mitchell. She is the project manager for the KBHN Able To's Fetal Alcohol Resource Program and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Calgary. I'm going to be listening for obvious personal reasons. I'm going to be listening to this one very carefully. Wendy, take it away. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. I'm so thrilled to be part of this KBHN conference and to have this opportunity to chair this session entitled Advancing Navigation Lessons from the KBHN Integrated Navigation Support Project. In the next 90 minutes, you will hear from nine different speakers as they share their navigational experiences, learnings, and innovations as part of this project. I encourage you to refer to the program to review the speakers' biographies as I don't have time to share the breadth and depth of their experiences, but I can assure you, these are amazing colleagues who are positively influencing navigational experiences for families. I wanna provide you with a brief overview of the session. We'll begin with Melissa, a parent who shares her personal navigational experience. The primary investigators, David Nicholas and Lucy Locke, will then orient you to the complexity of the navigational problem and the importance of this project and the need to collaborate and learn from partners in different jurisdictions. Michelle Hibert, postdoctoral fellow, will then provide the model of navigation that has emerged from our navigational learnings. The different jurisdictions involved in the project will then share their experience and innovations in advancing navigational supports in their respective areas. Lucy and David will then summarize the learnings from the session and we will conclude with questions. If questions arise for you during the presentations, please post them under the Q&A and at the end of the session, I will direct your questions to the team members. Let's begin with Melissa's lived experience, followed by an introduction to the project and the development of the navigational model. Hello, and thank you for letting me present at the Kids Brain Health um, Conference. I'm really happy to have been part of um, the greater project, and I just want to give you a little bit of a perspective from a caregiver's uh, lens. So this is kind of my journey. I feel like we're a little bit in an IKEA map, and I feel right now that we don't know where the shortcuts are, we don't know the pathway, and we don't know where we're going. And with the ages my kids are at, I feel like we're still stuck in the lobby. We have a long way to go before we get to the end. So this was my family nine years ago. My children were all adopted at birth. They're all indigenous and they were all prenatally exposed to alcohol. This is my family now. My kids are age 10, 11 and 12 and we do busy. We definitely are a busy family. Uh, having three kids with special needs uh, makes for an interesting life. My middle child is the most affected and he was diagnosed at the age of four. Um, and his journey has been a good example for us on navigating how we get through a day. Um, so my feeling of his early years and all my children's early years, having three kids under the age of three, was a bit of navigating blindly, having a blindfold on between and oscillating between that and explosions. I found a whole bunch of helpful resources, mostly through word of mouth or um, through online searches or even through just hearing about it from um, organizations that helped me out. So here are some of the the organizations and information that we used um, to navigate through that first initial um, stage. One excellent resource was ELVES and they provided a special needs Saturday course um, and they offered training for parents with kids with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And it was instrumental in helping me learn about kind of our journey and how we can move forward. But we took, after two years of that, we aged out. We also tried coaching families and that was a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And again, after a year of helping um, try trying to help me figure out how to navigate, we aged out. And so we were stuck with a symptom of, and then what? And we have had um, funding in school. So RCSD offered a whole bunch of different toolboxes for my children. And again, the government, um, because of COVID and financial situation in Alberta, it no longer exists. So then what? So 
in this time of COVID, we're really struggling to balance physical health, mental health, and our overall well-being. We've had to learn a lot about patience and tolerance of each other, as I have three kids who are online schooling from home, and my husband and I are both working from home. And I feel like there's a chronic uncertainty about what our future holds and hard to make these decisions on what we figure out, what how we figure out how to manage from day to day. So I'm stuck with the and then what? Um, we have to rely on my husband and myself, friends that are in the same boat. Um, I often spend time looking at books and articles and looking to talk to friends who are at the ne next stages. Um, we have struggled with school. Uh, we need to fight every single year, advocate for our children. We have respite, but it's hard to find someone who's uh, exceptionally qualified to deal with our busy. Um, and we have a really strong um, need for mental health, um, not only for our children, but also as caregivers. And this is especially uh, exacerbated by COVID. And so we we'll always look for ways to increase our resiliency. So in my utopian view of the land, mental health would become a priority for all caregivers. Um, there would be immediate and immense changes in the education system. Because I have children who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, I find there's a huge gap in funding after they turn their early years education until they are involved with the criminal justice system. There seems to be a huge gap uh, in services available. Um, there's difficulty in accessing diagnosis. There's no helplines that I know of for people dealing with FASD. And there are so many ideas on ways that we can try to make this world a bit easier to navigate. Um, there's a need for a great and educated pediatric care. Without our pediatrician, I'm not sure where I would be. And um, there's a need for a community of experienced families. My group of um, my group of ladies who helped me struggle, who are also struggling, has been hugely uh, important in my life. There's also needs to be medication that's been tested on children, especially with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder that's designed for children. And it's really important for me to always sit back and consider my child and his needs and his educational rights and his abilities. And I've really had to learn how to advocate um, because, you know, no one's going to do it for you. And um, I really thank you for listening to my talk. And, uh, you know, I think we're still in the world of IKEA and this is my journey and we are still in our lobby and, you know, we're always learning every day. So thank you very much. It's a privilege to speak with you today about this project and I'm here with with uh, members of our team including the co-lead on the project Dr. Lucy Locke who you're going to hear momentarily. Uh, if we can go to the next slide these are some of our lead partners and funders and uh, but there is a host of other partners as well and a project like this if we really want to move things forward in terms of navigation and, and families getting what they need when they need it. It takes many organizations within a jurisdiction. So I just want to acknowledge our terrific partners who have come on stream and are moving this initiative forward. And you're going to hear more about that in, in the rest of the presentation and, and seminar. I also want to speak, if we can move to the next slide, to navigation. What is that, that notion of navigation? Listen to this quote, parents say that they need someone, anyone, who can help them to interpret, access, understand, work with, coordinate the various systems they must manage in order to care for their child. And, and the picture on the right of the screen is one family's map, in a sense, of the various people and resources involved in their circle of care. And it's, it's uh, far-reaching and can be seen as daunting and that's what families need to deal with and uh, the question is how can we make that process less daunting for families how can we make it more streamlined more accessible so that families get what they need when they need it and thinking carefully about honoring the child and the family at the center of that picture I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Locke who's really going to speak to what is the problem and what do we need to do? What ha where have we been putting our efforts in this project and what are the implications in moving forward to make it better indeed for that 
child and family in the center of that picture. Dr. Locke? Right, so like David described, um, the multiple systems of services and supports that families, uh, that come in and out of families' lives um, are, are often left to families to, to try and figure out and navigate. Um, and, the, but, and so families are often left to fend for themselves. And knowing, much like Melissa described, when you land in Ikea, which aisle to go down, which door to open um, is, a, is a mystery. Um, and, and so families really do need support to improve that experience and improve access. As this parent of an eight-year-old with an intellectual disability described, sometimes I really don't know what I'm supposed to ask for or how to get a, um, go about it or what he really needs because I don't know what to do to help him sometimes. So this is a very, very busy depiction of what um, our projects are, are em embarking upon in relation, they're all concerned with improving the navigation experience of families. But they're not just uh, saying that, that we need to better equip parents who are already exhausted to become better navigators. Um, they're, we're, we're thinking about navigation very differently. You, you'll be hearing more about that model from um, Michelle Hébert. We're, all, we're interested in, um, in making a, a change in how, how families experience this, but also looking at making systems changes so that the, the, the um, responsibility is not just families to become better navigators, but for systems to make it easier for families to navigate through. So we have three projects, one from uh, located in Vancouver, BC that you'll be hearing from, one in Edmonton, Alberta, and one in Whitehorse and Watson Lake. And you'll be, um, you'll be hearing from these projects about the ways in which they went about trying to improve navigation. Good morning. I'd like to begin with a story. When one door closes, another one opens. That's not the reality for parents of neurodiverse children. Donna, Mother of three children is worried because her four-year-old son, Carl, is not talking. Donna's doctor insists, Carl will catch up. Donna knows in her gut that Carl needs help and repeatedly attempts to see a specialist. One door closes after the other. Carl is not eligible, they need to wait. Two years later, after searching and attempting to get proper paperwork, six-year-old Carl is finally assessed at the hospital. Carl is diagnosed with a neural disability and will likely need help his entire life. Donna is handed a detailed list of family supports. In the meantime, Carl is having tantrums and tolerances to foods, refusing to go to school. Donna is apprehensive about missing so much work. She searches online for supports. After six months of advocating, two doors open, then suddenly both doors close. The government abolishes funding for these supports, exhausted and overwhelmed. Donna fears for Carl's future. She's not alone. This year, one million children in Canada will be identified with a neuro disability, throwing families into a lifelong maze of seeking and not finding dead ends, unknowns, turns, and countless obstacles. Parents are forced to rethink their careers and where to live in order to get supports they need. Some good news. This short presentation introduces the model that was developed from the Kids Brain Health Network Cross-Regional Navigation Initiative. The next few slides will start to show how this framework contextualizes the struggle and can build the dream for families like Melissa's and Donna's. Findings that emerged from this project reveal multi-system processes. So we considered many models already in the literature and opted for an ecological systems theory, given that this theory is a conceptual framework that adds depth and scope to the complex processes that influence child and family navigation. Melissa, your share is a perfect example of doors opening and then closing, particularly in your family's case because of aging out. So if we look at our model, Melissa and her family, or Donna, Carl, and family, are positioned at the very center of six systems. 
which I will present one by one to foster a shared language around system navigation. First, the ONTO system consists of the child and family's physical and psychological state. So the child and family live within all six systems. Next, microsystems consist of the most proximal environments that interact directly with the child and family, such as the home, daycare or school, formal care centers, such as hospitals and therapy clinics and social service centers, non-government organizations like ELBS Special Needs Society in Alberta that Melissa mentioned, as well as community environments like the recreation center, day camp, pool, library, and peer groups and other community groups like Melissa's group of ladies. Each of these environments is a microsystem. So all of these environments represent microsystems in which the child and family directly engage and interact. The MISO system refers to interactions between individuals in these microsystems, such as the interaction between say Melissa and the pediatrician or a coach and a respite worker, parent teacher, parent librarian, child therapist, child peer, and teacher therapist, teacher physician, physician manager, therapist to therapist, coach therapist, coach librarian, just to name a few examples. All these interactions between people in microsystems that immediately wrap around the child and family represent the MISO system and impact the child and family experience with finding, accessing, and participating in programs and services. Next, the exosystem refers to formal linkages between the structures within which these individuals are embedded and the dy dynamics and processes between those structures. So, for example, a formal agreement between Sunny Hill Health Centre for Children and Autism Information Services in British Columbia, where now when a child is diagnosed with autism at Sunny Hill, Autism Information Services is informed and contacts the family, removing the onus on families to do all the legwork. Another example, the interagency partnerships established in the Yukon, where FASI, in collaboration with several agencies is providing disability education to underserved communities, which is building navigation capacity in rural regions and in Alberta with a province-wide 211 call-in platform where the public will be able to call in for information on disability programs and services. You'll hear more about these and other examples from the different regions next. These formal linkages represent structures, agreements, or partnerships as part of the exosystem. Although these linkages don't directly implicate the child and family, they ultimately have an impact on the child and family navigational experience and well being. On this slide, we'll begin from the outside in with chrono system and macro system examples. The chrono system represents time systems, such as transitions over the life course, as well as evolution and changing socio-historical contexts. The macro system refers to cultural values, traditions, and laws that are reflected in the patterns of interactions in the micro, meso, and exosystems. Macro systems evolve over time and change from generation to generation and differ based on geography, socioeconomic status, and ethnicity. An example of the changing socio-historical context in the background called the chrono system is the increased use of technology and social media during the last 30 years and a trend toward globalization. This changed socio-historical context has transformed transactions at every other layer of the ecosystem with online exchanges, video meetings, tech-based business, online get-togethers, virtual conferences like ours today, and the use of social media. This trend has irrevocably altered the way that children and families find, access, and participate in care services. An additional example of a changing socio-historical context is the pandemic context due to coronavirus. 
legislation and policies on physical distancing, mask wearing, and hand washing due to COVID-19 have shaped the delivery of supports and services. These restrictions vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Another is the socio-historic shifts where both parents work full-time along with prevalent divorce, for example, or separated or blended families who share custody, which have led to trends in single parenthood and grandparents as parents of children, as well as issues with school entry, which are matters of importance to all parents and are amplified for parents and families with a child who has a neurodisability. Another global trend is the increased visibility of disability and human rights which is reflected in formal documentation, recommendations and policy on accessibility for people who are, for example, in wheelchairs. While a trend toward disability rights is growing, there is much still to be transformed for children with neurodisabilities and families. And truth and reconciliation, which is a changing socio-historical context that led to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Jordan's principle. Together, these are the six systems from the Onto system through to the Chrono system. Here is the framework that emerged from the Kids Brain Health Network cross-regional, cross-sectoral, cross-systemic initiative. We've now submitted a, for a paper for publication to share about this framework. Thank you. We're off to an amazing start. I wanna say thank you, Melissa, for sharing your story. I've noted on chat that the audience has really appreciated you sharing your story and it has resonated with them. And to all of you for helping us to understand the complexity of navigation. And as part of this project, David and Lucy have been collaborating with key sites in BC, Alberta and the Yukon exploring each site's navigational goals and aspirations that are relevant to their environments. The different jurisdictions involved in the project are now going to share their experiences and innovations in advancing navigational supports in their respective areas. We'll begin with British Columbia, where you'll hear from Anton Miller, the lead from Vancouver and Dulcie Mercado, an autism support and resource specialist with Autism Information Services, British Columbia, and how their innovation has streamlined access to resources for families. You'll then get to listen to Angela Clancy, the Executive Director of Family Support Institute and a key project partner who will share how her organization is working to support navigation through parent support programs and training of resource parents and the community. She will also touch on BC's provincial initiative to improve navigational supports across the province. This will be followed by Sandy Littman, the project lead from Alberta, who will share the learnings from community conversations that she gathered from Edmonton and Northern Alberta and how the identification of navigational priorities has resulted in community collaborations and navigational innovations. And then we will transition to Wenda Bradley, the Executive Director of the Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Society Yukon or FASI. And she's also our lead from the Yukon where she will share their navigational innovations that include inserting a navigator in a remote and rural community and offering information and resources during a pandemic. Let's begin with the video. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be part of this panel today talking about the KBH and Navigation Project for Western Canada. British Columbia joined the project a number of years ago, and at the time that we entered into the, the collaboration, the leadership of Sunny Hill Health Centre had a great interest in improving transitions for children and families that we serve coming through our centre. Sunny Hill Health Centre is BC's tertiary academic centre for child development and rehab that includes diagnostic programs and rehabilitation programs. On the diagnostic side, we do detailed assessments uh, with often uh, children with complex set of neurodevelopmental needs, issues, and also who often come from complex environments. And then once we're done, we kind of provide diagnostic information, assessment information, recommendations, and send them back into the community. But I think many of us, including the leadership at Sunny Hill, felt, how can we help these families after coming through this process sort of land on their feet once they get back into their home communities? So there was great attraction to the theme of 
improving transitions, which is definitely a part of the broader um, concept of what navigation is. We've been discovering ourselves in British Columbia that navigation is a somewhat loaded and fraught term. Uh, it does mean different things to different people. But, you know, this improving transitions is a big part of it. So from the outset, one arm of our efforts in BC to participate in the navigation project was this goal of doing some kind of quality improvement within the Sunny Hill setting that would help us to improve transitions once children and families have left our center. Having hit on that, we also realized that British Columbia is a very large province with many different providers of services, quite apart from us at Sunny Hill, and uh, that there's uh, many children who are uh, living with developmental uh, differences and disabilities throughout the province um, don't even come to Sunny Hill. So we then moved on to develop a more two-pronged or two-track two approach to what British Columbia wanted to do within the navigation project. And you can see on this slide, the one arm was, as I just said, these kind of Sunny Hill quality improvement initiatives to improve transitions and help children and families land on their feet. Whereas the other part was a more provincial focus reaching out to providers and agencies who are already out there in the community across the province doing work to help families access services and supports and to navigate service systems. Another speaker subsequent on the program and coming soon is Angela Clancy from the Family Support Institute. And she's gonna talk a little bit more about the provincial side of this diagram, things that we've been doing under the provincial set of activities, including our provincial advisory group and our planned navigational summit, we call it, that we are planning very actively to take place in British Columbia. But what I'm going to do is briefly here just describe one particular Sunny Hill initiative that we undertook to improve transitions and help children and families land on their feet. And the example I'm going to talk about, and the speaker after me, Dulcie Mercado, is going to talk about, is from our autism network. British Columbia has a fairly extensive uh, system of uh, autism diagnostic clinics across the province that provide specialized, standardized diagnostic assessments for young children and teenagers too. Uh, children would come and have their assessment, a determination of their diagnostic status would be made. There'd be a sort of informative interview or a disclosing interview with the family as to the outcome of that and a number of recommendations made for interventions, treatments and supports in the community. And we would tell people about an important government-funded agency called Autism Information Services or ACE, AIS, that exists particularly to provide a resource for anybody with autism and related conditions throughout the province with information, supports, ideas, guidance, and so on. So we would sort of say, okay, so here's a brochure, a document about ACE, and we suggest you get in touch with them. Um, but after they left, you know, we didn't really know how families were doing in terms of getting on with all the, the services and supports we'd recommended, and particularly too, whether they had contacted ACE or accessed that service. So the big idea that we had in this quality improvement realm was to make the default situation that Sunnyhill would actively, proactively refer the child and family to ACE. And then uh, so in order for ACE to provide community-based services and supports, uh, and to check in with the family unless the family opted out while they were still at Sunny Hill. So this did require some changes from our sort of operating procedures. We had to provide more information on what ACE is and why it could be helpful. We had to obtain consent to refer families to ACE. And there were also some practical and logistical issues that needed to be uh, navigated in order to transmit this information and the um, consent to Autism Information Services. But the, the change was implemented and our sense to date is that it actually has been very helpful and helps to sort of ground families and make that transition better. That's been our perspective at Sunny Hill. The next speaker, Dalcy Mercado from ACE, is going to talk a little bit more about her perception of how this important change for British Columbia has gone ahead and what their sense is of how it's working. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Dulcie Mercado and I am so grateful to be joining you all today from the unceded and traditional territory of the Musqueam people. I'm grateful and give thanks for the opportunity to be a visitor on this beautiful land. I'm currently working as an autism support and resource specialist with Autism Information Services British Columbia. We are a provincial information centre for autism and related disorders. Our program is housed within the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Our role as specialists is to assist families, caregivers, 
service providers, and community partners by being a source of information and resources and assisting in navigating available supports and services in their community. ASPC specialists are available by phone, through a toll-free phone number, through email, or face-to-face -face meetings, depending on how a family or caregiver prefers to communicate. We have staff members who speak a total of five languages and dialects, and we also have access to interpreters for additional languages to support families in whatever way they feel the most comfortable. In late 2018, ASPC and the Sunny Hill site for the British Columbia Autism Assessment Network, or BCAN, piloted a project whereby families and caregivers whose child received an autism diagnosis at Sunny Hill were provided an opportunity to sign a consent form. This consent form allowed ASPC specialists to contact families shortly after their family conference when they would have received their child's diagnosis to offer navigation supports and invite families to ask any questions that they may have. ASPC specialists try to contact families within the first two weeks of their child's diagnosis. During this first contact, specialists introduce themselves and our program and then ask, assist in answering questions families may have about their next steps. These questions can be anything from how to apply for the autism funding program to questions about the different professionals who may become involved with their child to what supports and services might be available in their community. Offering assistance and support by initiating conversation with families rather than waiting for them to reach out provides families the opportunity to access information and resources as soon as they are ready to receive it. Typically, a specialist will have multiple conversations and email exchanges with a family as they work through getting supports in place for their child. It is quite common for a parent to contact ASPC a few times after this initial conversation with follow-up questions as they arise. Essentially, by initiating the conversation with families, ASPC has found that many families will continue to use us as a source of up-to-date information related to the needs of their child as their child grows and changes. Since December of 2018, ASPC received approximately 630 consent forms, and of the 630 families and caregivers, we have been able to connect with 82% of those families and provide varying levels of navigation support and assistance. Much of the navigation support provided to these families was centered around what to do next after they receive their child's diagnosis. Specialists are able to take the time to connect with families and provide them with the information they need to begin accessing available supports and services to meet the needs of their child and their family. Currently, this project is still in a pilot stage and offering this unique navigation support to a limited amount of families who receive their child's diagnosis at the Sunny Hills site. The hope is that we will be able to one day expand the program and offer supports to additional BCAN sites across the province. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Kids Brain Health Network. My name is Angela Clancy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Family Support Institute of British Columbia. I'm here this morning to talk to you about our peer support network of volunteers that are situated all across the province. I'm also a sister, so I have experience as being a family member who experiences peer-to-peer -peer support. I want to tell you about FSI. We're a provincial nonprofit society. We're also a registered charity. I report to a provincial nonprofit board of directors. We also have 27 staff located all across the province. All of our staff are also family members. That's part of our shared experience. Here's our vision and mission statement of our organization. And this is what runs our organization. This is what drives everything that we do. Our vision is that individuals and families are supported, connected, and fully valued in their community. Our mission is to strengthen, connect, and build communities and resources with families of people with disabilities in British Columbia. Everything our organization does surrounds this vision and mission. Our beliefs are also what drives everything that we do. We believe that families are the best voice to speak for their unique circumstances. We also believe that informed, involved, and confident families are the most effective agents for creating social change. We believe families are the most empowered to speak for themselves when needed. 
We believe that families are the best resource to support one another, and we believe families have a critical role in shaping the future for their family members. We were started 35, almost 36 years ago, and we grew out of an era that did not value the pivotal role of families, and that is where our belief system grew out of. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we have to offer as an organization. We offer peer-to-peer -peer support for anyone, any age, with any disability in their family, including concurrent conditions anywhere in the province. And what that means is we will never say no to anybody. We have over 285 peer mentors located all across the province of British Columbia. We offer free supports and services for families. You do not have, a, have to have a diagnosis to call. Cost will never be a barrier when you call our organization. We offer workshops and training, and all of our workshops are parent-written or family-written and family-led. We offer networking opportunities. We know that families want to connect with one another, and we provide that in all sorts of mediums. And we also offer information sharing and referral. And like you saw in our belief systems, families are empowered when they have information at, the, at their hands. And so what can our volunteer resource parents do? They can connect by phone, email, text, in person. I know COVID has prevented that in certain um, circumstances, but they can do that. We can guide families to community resources. We can attend meetings, take notes, debrief with families. We can coach and mentor advocacy to empower families to have a voice. We can listen and learn together. We can share successes and we can celebrate families. Families and their family members deserve to share those successes and to celebrate together. Our contact information is on this slide. If you wanna know more about us, please connect with us. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what is the impact of family to family support. We have been told and we know families when they connect with one another feel less, less isolated. They feel more understood, they feel accepted, they feel more connected and empowered. This is where the family movement in BC and all across Canada has come from is families coming together. There's a culture of hope when families are connected to one another and they share experiences. There's an increased individual and family capacity when families connect with one another. We appreciate this quote. In a healthy community, citizens believe they can influence the things that affect their lives and that mutual support, self-reliance and respect are valued. A healthy community will value peer support. So what does coaching, advocacy and support look like? In our organization, that looks like supporting families to find the information, resources, policies and procedures that they need when they need it and helping them to know their rights. It can support families to take a break when their emotions are running high. That might be in a meeting and come back to the table with the solutions that make sense for them. It also means avoiding blame language and actually focusing on what does the impact on the family look like. It's supporting families to follow good process. We know that every system has a process in place and we encourage families to use that process and it might mean climbing the ladders one step at a time. It's helping families to know who those decision makers are and it's helping families to navigate systems and find their way to the people who they need to talk to at the right time and have their voices heard and we will walk the journey alongside them. That's what coaching, advocacy, and support looks like to us. So in BC, and you're going to hear about this in a couple of other sessions, um, along with the support of an anonymous donor, with the Kids Brain Health Network, and led um, by Sunny Hill, 
we have a pilot running um, and it um, for us in British Columbia, we know that navigation supports has been extremely difficult for families. And so we have convened groups of organizations to define and develop some common understanding of navigational supports. And we've created a group called the Provincial Advisory Group. And we've been trying to define what navigational supports for families of kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities can and should look like in British Columbia. We've created a community of practice um, that will be family-centered and focused on best practice around navigation for neurodevelopmental disability supports in BC. We're planning a summit um, and to ensure that partners are informed educated, um, engaged, and participating in navigational supports. And we are hoping to, that after this summit that's planned for January, there will be subsequent strategies around this to assist in understanding and improving navigational supports. We will be guided by research. That's an imperative part of this work. We will keep children and families at the center of our work and working towards another summit with partnership and integrity and we will straight, stay true to quality. So this is our BC pilot. We're very excited about it and we hope that you will stay with us and pay attention to the work that we're doing. So that's the work of the Family Support Institute and our pilot in BC. Um, please pay attention to the work that all of us are doing here in BC. We are very proud of the work that we do. Peer support is critical to the work of families here in BC and to our organization. So thank you very much. I'm now going to share with you a digital story from one of our original uh, resource parents. Her digital story focuses on the experience of peer-to-peer -peer support. Her name is Bonnie Fallowfield, and the story tells her journey of peer support throughout the entire course of her life and the positive impacts that it had on her family. So enjoy. I was sitting in the parent lounge of the neonatal intensive care unit when a mother that I had become close with over the past month came over and asked me to be with her as they took her son off life support. I was already feeling emotionally raw after almost losing my own son on numerous occasions, but I agreed. Afterwards, we spent two hours talking and through the tears, I recognized for the first time the importance of connecting with someone walking the same path. All of the life-threatening moments and life-saving procedures in those early days took a toll on Nolan, causing blindness and other complications. Finally returning home, three and a half months later, the constant medical appointments and therapies began. I felt very isolated, alone, and afraid. I thought there were no other parents going through what we were, and finally, after three years, I reached out to the Family Support Institute of BC. After a two-hour phone call with Jane Holland, I agreed to travel down to White Rock and attend my first training weekend. I was amazed, and I felt so empowered that I came back and volunteered as a resource parent, offering peer-to-peer -peer support for families in my community for the next 11 years until Nolan turned 14. That year, we had made 12 trips to the emergency room. Eventually, on the 13th trip, he had a mental breakdown and was transferred 120 kilometers away to the adolescent psych ward in Prince George where he was finally diagnosed, not only with autism, but with bipolar as well. I will never forget coming down the elevator, having to leave him there in such a terrible state of fear and confusion. When the doors to the elevator opened, I fell into a chair and sobbed uncontrollably for a long time. Blindness was easy compared to this. Who is gonna help us now? How would we survive? We were devastated as a family, and I became angry and bitter about what had happened. We struggled for years to find the right diagnosis, and now we had to struggle to find the right medications and dosages to empower him to move forward in his life. Through counseling, I realized that I needed to come up for air. 
I'd miss going to FSI's training weekend for a few years during this time and needed to get connected again so that I could move forward as well. That weekend, I connected in a different way with people and learned the term dual diagnosis, mental health combined with other diverse abilities. I felt so empowered to come home and again begin helping families in my community. Over the last 30 years, I have listened deeply to many stories, letting families know that they were not alone. Most importantly, I shared in their celebration of successes and continued to bring back new information like the at-home program, giving and action funding, microboards, individualized funding options, housing options, and FSI's resources, to name a few. I feel so grateful for the wonderful friends and mentors that I have met over the years. I have had the privilege of being on FSI's board and now work as a regional network coordinator. I plan on retiring this May, but I will continue to support other parents and attend training weekends until the day I die. That is how much this family means to me. Thank you, British Columbia. That is amazing. Before I carry on, I just want to speak to everybody in the audience. If you're percolating on a question, please make sure to post that question. I can see a couple questions there already, but if you have a question that you want to ask any of our team members, please post it there um, and we will get to those questions. British Columbia, Bonnie's story, Angela Clancy, Anton Miller and Dulcie Mercado. Thank you for sharing your innovations to support newly diagnosed families, for emphasizing the importance of parent support for families on their navigational journeys, and for spearheading a provincial initiative aimed at improving navigational experiences for all families in your province. I wanna shift now to Alberta and Sandy Littman. She is the project lead and she's gonna share how Alberta has identified navigational priorities and has taken actions based on the needs of those in her community. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here today uh, representing the Alberta arm of the KBHN Navigation Project and telling you about our journey through this project. So we started with this group of foundational partners, including advocacy groups, service organizations, and academics. And we built on to add to our steering committee uh, other membership, including leaders from community and social services, disability services, education, parent representation, and the Alberta Office for the Advocate for Persons with Disabilities. And then we collaborated, kind of building on our stakeholder group, collaborated with a committee of senior directors from all our Alberta ministries dealing with children and families and with Alberta 211. So one of the key elements of this project is bringing together these stakeholders, in many cases for the first time, to work on a project that we all care deeply about. So why did we care about this project? Most of us have been working in this field for many years, and we have heard from families forever that they struggle finding appropriate services for their children with NDD. So we know from anecdotal reports and from the literature that this is not a, a unique um, uh, experience that our families have. So our vision became that families with children and youth with NDD will be able to easily access needed and available services. It was a three-year project and the first year of the project was spent really developing those foundational aspects of the project. So the broad-based steering committee, relationships with other stakeholders, uh, establishing core principles and processes that would lead us through the project. And then we moved on to do our research, uh, looking at the literature and beginning our community conversations. You can see that year two and three are very vague in terms of the project plan. And that was intentionally like that because we wanted your, our action plan to uh, be guided by what we heard 
uh, from, from the families and from the service providers and to be guided by our uh, core principles and processes. So one of our earliest activities was to develop a consensus of the core principles that would guide the project. And we had those printed at the top of every agenda and we reviewed them periodically to make sure that they were relevant and still being followed. Most of the principles talked about what the navigation support system should actually look like. Uh, but the first principle, inclusion and widespread engagement of stakeholders, was probably the most important principle that determined how we needed to work. So given that, where we started with was community conversations to find out what was important to the community of families and service providers. We met with over 200 family self-advocates and service providers between central and northern Alberta. Uh, we traveled to where the communities were located we hosted over 30 community conversations and then had many individual uh, interviews with families and service provider, providers. And the purpose of the uh, community conversations was to learn about the experience of families seeking services and resources for their children with NDD and the impact. So the challenges uh, for parents and, and, and uh, service providers were quite consistent with one another. They all talked about the challenges of there being an overly complex system, uh, multiple sectors, uh, fragmented services, uh, and, and lack of really a, a very clear pathway for finding services. They also talked about varying levels of knowledge about services, about neurodevelopmental uh, differences and, the, uh, and how to cope with the child's diagnosis and the impact of NDDs on the child, uh, on their learning, on their development and on uh, the family. So the flip side of this was what facilitated navigation. Uh, and there was quite a bit of consensus again about when uh, service providers are knowledgeable about what the services are and how to find them. When there was an understanding of NDD and the child's needs, that it made it much easier for the families to find the services they need, needed. And they also talked about quite consistently relationships. So when caregivers and service providers had good relationships, the the families knew who to speak to, who to call. Uh, this helped tremendously. And then when service providers and agencies had good relationships and they uh, talked to each other and worked together to work with the families, this was extremely helpful. So pulling together all of this information, we again regrouped to look at what should our plan be for year two and three of this project what was feasible to do and what would have the greatest impact. And we settled on this middle section that's highlighted. So year two and three, uh, the focus was on improving accessi accessibility of information about resources, uh, developing a comprehensive, comprehensive list of resources, of services, and focusing on providing training resources for navigators and others to improve their knowledge of NDD and the issues that families face in navigating services. And then with feedback from policymakers with a view to sustainability, we agreed as a group to work with existing navigation services that the government already supports, namely 211 Alberta. And through this year two and three, we were fortunate to have the support of Nate and their Northern Alberta Institute of Technology and their B Tech students who joined our project team for their capstone project and help provide the manpower that we needed to work on this action plan. And thanks to Melissa Dobson, Associate Chair and Instructor at NATE, who you've already heard from earlier for facilitating this partnership. So the focus of the first NATE capstone groups of students was to um, uh, was on access of information and specifically website accessibility and support. So they went through a process of um, research and consultation to determine what families believe are the most important features of an accessible navigation website. And uh, they uh, 
heard uh, again uh, through focus groups and surveys that first and foremost, parents want accurate, inclusive, and relevant information. They want a website that's easy to, uh, to navigate with relevant menus. But also very important was to have access to a um, knowledgeable in-person or phone navigation support, uh, including telephone operators who have insight into the topics being researched. They also wanted access to educational materials and ways of connecting with other families. The, this, in, this uh, information about what parents want has been passed on to 211 Alberta, and fortunately they're in the process right now of reviewing their website and improving it, and they happily took our recommendations under advisement. The second activity um, in the work plan for the, this last uh, year and a half was consolidating, uh, developing a consolidated list of resources. So our Nate Capstone group again uh, pulled together resource databases from our partners and other existing uh, uh, sites with large resource databases in Alberta uh, with, uh, that contained resources for children with NDD. And they came up with 928 unique organizations. When they cross-referenced this with Alberta 211, Alberta 211 had 55% of these in their database. But an important distinction is that Alberta 211 does not have for-profit organizations in their database, and our group included those. So we had some discussion with 211 Alberta about whether they could include those and uh, we are still um, under discussion about that. So the third uh, activity um, for the uh, last year of the project was uh, the development of an NDD educational toolkit uh, for 211 navigators and others. So with the uh, funding, additional funding support from the Sameev Family Foundation and a second group of Nate Capstone students, we're working on this toolkit. Um, we're looking at these, so this is the framework for the toolkit and each of these topics, our intention is to build a module around the topics with um, uh, videos, uh, fact sheets, and uh, links to other uh, vetted links. Um, and the students are right now looking at the various formats to be able to develop engaging presentations. So they're going to build a prototype uh, module, refine and replicate that. Uh, and we are uh, right now just at the beginning of that process and obviously we'll not be able to complete it uh, within um, uh, the three year limit of this project. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at how we carry on. So, this is uh, where we've come from. Uh, first of all, we brought together a broad group of stakeholders in this field. Uh, we followed our process of our principle of inclusion, bringing together families, uh, advocacy groups, service providers, and policymakers to develop a consensus about the work, to have joint ownership of the work, and the products of the work. So I think we've accomplished a lot through this process, but we still have a long way to go. We're still early in the process of development of the toolkit. Um, and sustainability is really the one, number one issue that we're discussing at our steering committee at this point. We need to find a way to complete version one of the toolkit. Um, and we're uh, discussing how do we continue to work together, not only to complete this work, but to set a joint agenda to support this population of children and families. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Sandy, so much for sharing how community conversations have shaped Alberta's navigational initiatives. Your partnerships, the ones you have with Nate and 211, those will positively influence navigational practices for all Albertans. At this time, I'd like to have a conversation with Wenda Bradley, the Executive Director of FASI and the lead in the Yukon. Wenda, you have done some wonderful work in Whitehorse and the Yukon, the Yukon supporting navigation. Given our limited time together, can we focus on the work that you've been doing in Watson Lake, a rural and remote community? 
You're working collaboratively with community partners to support individuals and families, helping them to navigate systems and services. On the surface, that sounds simple. Can you explain how this was accomplished? Yes, thank you, Wendy. Um, yes, it sounds simple, um, but lengthy and complicated in process as relationships had to be built. However, we did have a bit of a head start. In 2016, FASI had built a relationship with the community of Watson Lake through a rural education project we had um, done in collaboration with the community or the Council of Yukon First Nations. The project focused on increasing local capacity through a, a collaborative support approach to pr service provision. The Watson Lake Interagency Committee was eager to be part of this education. So over a period of three months, many members of the Interagency Committee took part in this workshop that did take place over time. During this time, the Yukon was also starting to form a committee to look at the develop, development of an FASD 10-year plan uh, through an interagency committee which brought together different sectors of the community, including family members, people living with FASD, NGOs and government services. The committee was also overseen by an ADM committee from the government. The Yukon FASD interagency committee acknowledged and recognized that there were vast uh, differences within each community uh, in the Yukon, so it took it upon itself to reach out to the 15 different communities separately to seek their advice on how and what it, this should look like in their community. It was decided that we would use a tool developed by Dr. Lori Vitale Cox from uh, New Brunswick, who developed this in um, collaboration with the First Nations community there. The Medicine We All Community Developmental Tool um, helped us to have an in-depth discussion with each community about this very uh, sensitive issue. And at the end of this discussion, the community members in Watson Lake recognize that they have the resources that are available, but the problem lay in answering the question, why are not people, why are people not accessing these services? Right, so <clears throat> services are there, but people aren't accessing. So your organization introduced a navigator within Watson Lake, and that's had a significant impact on um, access to services and also on interagency partnerships. Can you tell me about how that's working? Yes, um, we we're lucky to have uh, an opportunity to come um, from the Kids Brain Health Network and the Systems Navigation Project. Um, we had learned from our previous experience that we cannot do everything on our own. Collaboration is important and developing a circle of support around people is, is, is necessary. So I took this offer to the Yukon FASD Interagency Committee and they were very excited, um, which brought more opportunities, funding, and then a plan to reach out to other communities. Again, building on what we had previously done, um, I hired Shelley, who had previously worked in a rural community, um, has worked with FASI and had just finished working on the FASD prevalence study done by the Yukon Disability. So that was a different bit of uh, work for us. Um, within all the communities. So we're very active in reaching out to other services like Autism Yukon to be partners. And most services were very eager to help us with this. It was decided, it was a decision by the Watson Lake Interagency Committee to hire locally because that's how um, we would get the best intake, you know, uptake from the community. So Angela was hired to, to as the systems navigator. Um, she's a long-term resident of Watson Lake and has worked in an outreach role of different in a different project, so familiar with the people that we were trying to reach and that she knew uh, would need support. It was recognized also that working in a small community uh, with your own uh, community members and a distance from um, other supports would bring on stress. So we also brought on Sue, a retired nurse and also long-term resident, resident to support Angela in her work. Um, the agency's there have been working together well and have and are having someone on the ground to walk with the person needing support uh, was crucial. On one occasion, we received a referral from a Yukon Housing Corporation um, asking us for assistance of an individual who they were having to uh, evict. And after some discussion with the individual, it was learned that the reason for the eviction was because they hadn't done their taxes that year. And so uh, Angela called me. I knew how to get this done. And I connected the volunteer who um, from the CRA to do the person's uh, taxes and on the ground uh, we were uh, able to save an eviction with uh, cooperation with um, Yukon Housing Corporation. 
this connection um, with Yukon Housing then um, ended up with them offering us an office space uh, uh, in kind in the location that was um, a great position to have our office that was central to the town. So it worked out very well. Well, and your slide certainly demonstrates the, the partnerships and the number of connections that you have. You've also done um, uh, amazing work outside of Watson Lake. And the work that FASI does, you recognize um, the need for navigational service. What's next for you and your agency? Well, basically, we're trying to sustain this program. Uh, we've had an evaluation done with financial supports from the FASD Interagency Committee, um, Yukon government funding, and are waiting for a final report on that. So we're just, um, we, it's in the process, we're looking to see where it is that we're going to need to tweak things. So we'll look um, at that and see where we go from there. However, the Reaching um, Home Federal Government Program um, has offered some funding. This is the uh, monies that help with people who are homeless and the effects of being homeless and then helping them to find housing. Um, so we're working with them and have some funding coming from them. Um, and it's, it is on the ground and we've heard from community members that it is a vital support for the most vulnerable uh, community members in that community. It is helped with children in school, um, people uh, who are homeless and ex in accessing services like medical needs. Um, we've, done, we've helped people get to treatment programs. We've also helped people in the justice system so that we're looking to uh, keep it going. Um, we are looking to reach out to a little, another community. However, this is becoming a bit of a problem because of the logistics of location. Um, we are very far apart from each other up here. So uh, for one person or one group to do the work um, is very daunting, but the, the, um, we are reaching out to a smaller community that is closer to Watson Lake so that we have a bit of a, a hub forming for that uh, systems navigation program. Again, the emphasis on the, the connections and the collaboration. Very quickly, um, education and training has always been an important element of the navigational services that you offer, both in Watson Lake and more broadly within the Yukon. And it's been difficult to offer education and training during the pandemic, but you and your partners have been innovative in how you've been offering training. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so because of the distance, um, we, we use an online platform and one of the platforms we're using is called Fu Open Future Learning, which talks about different um, ideas and concepts and issues that people with disability, neurodevelopmental disabilities particularly have. Um, and we also use the Ken FASD, um, FASD Foundations program information. Uh, again, it's all free so that we can get people in. Now, the, the um, Opening Future Learning does have a cost uh, to the services, but um, we're trying to cover that with monies under the CHEM, which is the Knowledge and Exchange Committee under the FASD Interagency Committee. So we're doing that, but, and under that committee, we had a great um, uh, idea come up, collaboratively helped to put up an information booth on FASD International Day, Awareness Day. And so as you can see in this slide, there's a booth there. We had lots of people come by and we specifically um, were lucky to have done this through the lunch period. And about 20 grade seven and eight students from a, a nearby school um, came because of a cupcake we were handing out, but also did have information to learn about FASD. So it's kind of a win-win for us at that time. But as we've been talking, you know, relationships are very important and our work is based on relationship building. And that is a two-way street of respect and support. During the initial phase of the pandemic, the Kwanlin Dunn Cultural Center Sewing Group uh, created these beautiful firewind, uh, fireweed pins to give out to essential workers. And the systems navigators in Watson Lake were considered essential and provided, um, provided support to many community members. This recognition by the community was an honor to our team. So I'd like to end with showing you a small video that we've created about the project. So um, I'm hoping that'll come up next. The neighboring communities of Watson Lake and Lower Post, like many communities across Canada, struggle with the legacy of residential schools. Intergenerational trauma and the coping mechanisms that people use are always present in the background, like the remote, vast, and beautiful wilderness that surrounds the towns. 
In the fall of 2016, I was invited to Watson Lake to provide education to members of the Watson Lake Interagency Committee on working with people affected by FASD. I was not aware that one of the participants was a community member rather than a service provider. She was looking to volunteer at the local women's shelter. I noticed her increased anxiety as we progressed through the information, eventually breaking down and emotionally saying, I need all the support you are talking about for my grandson. Today, I couldn't even feed him. I quickly shifted the focus of the workshop with her permission, facilitating the group to come up with a plan to help her access services that very day. The same fall, I was approached by a member of the Kids Brain Health Network who asked if we would be interested in a project about systems navigation. Gaining the support of the Yukon Interagency Committee on FASD, I seized this opportunity and quickly got moving by hiring a project coordinator, Shelley Halverson. She reached out to the Watson Lake Interagency Committee for direction and they were keen to have us do this after the experience they had at our earlier workshop. A local steering group and hiring committee was formed and they began the challenging task of finding the right person for the systems navigation job. Unfortunately, a forest fire erupted that summer, causing the community of Lower Post to be evacuated to Watson Lake. Shelley was there to meet with the interagency committee and was asked to help and she pitched right in. Her work modeled what a systems navigator could do, echoing the need for that role in Watson Lake. Eventually, Shelley and the hiring committee were excited to hire Angela as our systems navigator. Finding a safe place to work from will also prove to be a challenge, but eventually we collaborated with the Yukon Housing Corporation, who shared an office space with us at no cost. Working alone could be difficult, and someone at the end of a phone miles away was not always what was needed. So we hired Sue, a retired nurse in the community, to provide clinical case coordination, administrative support, and local networking. Together, they were key to continuing success. Both of them had trusted relationships already built within the community. Then the pandemic hit. Angela remained one of the only services still working in direct contact with people. She recognized quickly many community members were struggling, especially around obtaining food. So with my support and her family helping, she warmed up her food truck and cooked several hundred meals to feed those most in need. People were touched to know that someone cared enough to help them in such a practical and thoughtful way. Eventually, with the Systems Navigation Program taking the lead, an interagency meeting led to federal funding, local First Nation support, town council involvement, and many services and NGOs agreeing to help out. The Watson Lake Hearts and Hands Meal and Hamper Delivery Program was developed and fed over 200 people for three months. From then on, the whole community knew about the Systems Navigation Project and how it could support the most vulnerable members of the community. About a year after that initial workshop, I was in Watson Lake when a woman approached me who I didn't recognize. She started thanking me for helping her and it took me a moment to realize that it was the grandmother from that first workshop. She looked so different, so much happier. It was a powerful reminder for me that when you have a positive relationship, and take time to listen, understand, and act, people's lives can be changed. Another powerful, very powerful video. Thank you for sharing the Yukon story with us, Wenda. Your partnerships and relationships coming together to influence the lives of families. I'd like to call now on David and Lucy for you to share your thoughts as you've reflected on what everybody has shared with us today. David, Lucy. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thank you to all the presenters um, who have participated in putting this together. It was no small, small accomplishment. For those of you who are watching and wondering about, uh, about navigation in your own communities, I'm, I'm, David and I are going to try and wrap this up and help you to think about kind of what are the key ideas or key concepts that you need to reflect on perhaps and that we've learned about through this project um, that, we'll, that we hopefully will take forward um, with us. This project started out being about moving the needle on navigation for families so that they could get what they need when they need it. 
Um, the ecosystemic framework that Michelle Hebert presented um, really helps us to think about the who and the what um, consists of navigation. The how, how we did this um, is a sl slightly different story. I think each of these jurisdictions came on board with a passion and a desire and an acknowledgement that navigation needed to be improved. And what we've learned is I, I would I'd identify maybe five key con core concepts so far um, for, for other communities um, moving forward. First is the concept of uh, relationships and the importance of relationships and uh, developing a shared sense of principles or values as organizations, um, both government and non-government organizations come together to reflect on navigation. Without this core set of uh, values or principles, I think the, there is a, a risk that things can unravel and, and things do get tough on when decisions have to be made, but having those values and principles to fall back on um, is an important core component of moving things forward. The second piece has to do with taking stock of what your assets are, your local assets in your community are, and there are many. Um, and developing a shared understanding of what those assets are, um, as well as a shared understanding of what the challenges are. Uh, and this has to be done as a group. The third piece has to do with appreciating the very unique idiosyncrasies of each jurisdiction. We couldn't come in to this project and say, BC, this is what you need to do. Alberta, this is what you need to do. It really depends so greatly on um, what the unique, uh, it, the unique ways in which services already operate and what the strengths and what the gaps are. And finally, um, we, in developing a plan for implementation, um, there is a piece that happens on the ground. Ultimately, we, you know, each jurisdiction had to find something to do that was based on their understanding of what, what, what needed to be fixed or, or what was broken or what could be improved. Um, but there was another component, which is there, there was a higher, in each jurisdiction, there was a, a, an advisory group that included decision makers, policy makers that were both observing and participating. And that's because observe, the, the decision makers and policy makers themselves can't make this happen any more than any single organization can make it happen. It's really contingent on having a, both an iterative and a, a, it's this iterative process between those who are um, involved in, in supporting families and those who are thinking about policy in relation to families. Those are my reflections. David, you wanna take it from here? Thank you, Lucy. It's such important principles. And just to add on that, I hope what we've conveyed today, and thank you to our speakers, I hope what we've conveyed suggests that navigation is not a one-size-fits-all approach, but rather what we found is it's a systematic approach to proactively targeting the unique needs in context in your community and, and identifying, as Lucia said, what are the strengths and the challenges, the opportunities for moving the needle? and doing that together. And it really does invite us to think uh, strategically and, and in, in a way where we're working together towards a common end. And that's really what this project has been about. The principles that Lucy spoke about have been developed in a community guide, which we are, are in the midst of creating in order to build the capacity, not only in these three regions of BC, Alberta, and the Yukon, but, but be a resource for other communities across the country. So we'd invite people, if you're interested in hearing more about this or thinking about how this could be of benefit in, in addressing the areas of strength and building the capacity in your community, feel free to reach out to us and, and we're, we'd be happy to meet with you and move that forward. And that's really the focus uh, of our work as we move forward uh, up from this point. Um, I, I, just to build on Lucy's uh, point, some of the key principles that we have learned as we have uh, grappled with this community by community, region by region, is, is to selectively and carefully think about the key transitions points in, in your community, in our communities. Uh, the inflection points, the struggles across continuum of care, 
going back to Melissa's terrific presentation and the struggles that she spoke about in traversing across the various systems of care. And, and to move towards that, thinking about this as a, a community endeavor at the multiple levels of your community, those system levels that Michelle spoke about uh, from the, the child and the family, all through the organizations and how those organizations work together in tandem. And, and I think the, the, the work of this project in some ways has required a backbone commitment. And what I mean by that is support to engage us to be at the same table. And I think what we're called to is work together well in new ways and to think about how do we structure that in a way that ultimately benefits families. David, can uh, I just so, so I, can what I, we've I, I, engaged in is... Can I just come in here for a second? Because I, sure. I think this, this point that you're making is really, really important. It's, it's if, if communities want to move the needle on navigation, inserting more navigators into the system isn't enough. Making parents better equipped to become navigators isn't enough. Shifting the needle on navigation actually involves work at every single layer of the system, making parent to parent connections, um, you know, equipping and training navigators to become better navigators, certainly giving parents knowledge and information that they're asking for, as well as creating these interagency connections. I can't stress that enough. So true, Lucy. And I think the, the key in each of the reason, regions has been relationship building. And, uh, and it's so important for the sake of what others have said already, families getting what they need when they need it in a more seamless way. So may it be in your community. And speaking of the importance of relationships, we have one more digital story to show you. This is a uh, has been put together by Janice Bushfield of the Cerebral Palsy Association in Alberta. And Janice is on the Alberta Team Steering Committee. And why don't we watch that? And, and as you're watching that, know to get, once again, what Janice, I think, conveys amongst many gems of information, but the importance of relationship in working together better. We can cue that uh, that digital story if that's possible, and we'll watch that, and then we'll open up to questions. The feeling I remember most from those early days is fear. After weeks of monitors and healthcare professionals in and out of the room, I didn't know if I could do it on my own. But you live and you grow through it. You experience the trauma of diagnosis. You search Google, join support groups, and you do it all over again when there's new surgeries, treatments, and crisis. Eventually you get good at it, and I decided I wanted to take what I was learning and do something with it. Being a small organization, it is pretty clear you cannot achieve everything on your own. Partnerships and networking are essential. I was constantly reaching out to other groups. What challenges were they facing and what solutions had they found that we could use? In doing this, I realized there were many common themes across the neurodevelopmental spectrum and that working together was the only way to address the larger issues. So in 2018, when I was approached to be part of the Kids Brain Health Navigation Project, I signed on right away. It just made sense. Collaborating with others was second nature to me and I knew it would be a great opportunity to build more relationships. We began meeting once a month and it seemed like Sandy, our project lead, would bring new people to the table at every meeting. Physicians, researchers, educators, community organizations, advocates, government reps. As more people joined, it became apparent that there was a lot of resources available, but we just didn't know about each other. For many of the team members, it was hard enough to keep their own organizations running or manage their teaching load and grant applications, or keep up with clinic responsibilities, while also maintaining our momentum as a group. But no matter what the progress of the work, the relationships continued to develop. Two years into the project, I was part of the team that was invited to Vancouver to present about our community consultations and how we had developed a strong network of relationships around Alberta. It was interesting and inspiring to see how each provincial team had approached the same challenges differently. 
the new relationships and learning sent us all home with a new excitement and concrete actions. The success of FSI peer mentorship model that we learned about at the meeting led us to do an environmental scan which in turn moved us towards working with 211 as a navigation opportunity. This was not an original goal of the project, but through networking and relationship building in Alberta and then across the provinces, we identified something that has the potential to impact families nationwide. The Kids Brain Health Project re-emphasized my belief that there is value in collaborating beyond your city and province. We can learn from each other, but in order to do that, we need to know each other. Relationships matter if we are going to turn ideas into action. Thank you, uh, David and Lucy, for summing up and for sharing that amazing story of Janice's with us. We have about uh, 15 minutes for question and answers. And as you can see from our screen, we're like the Brady Bunch here. Um, and so I've got some questions that are from the chat. So I'm going to pose this first question. Um, it, it speaks to the important role of peer supports and navigation. And the question is, what advice do you have for policymakers to enhance rather than replace provincial supports. I wonder if maybe Lucy and David, would you like to start with that? And then we'll, we'll bring in our panel members as well. David, you can, you can take this. I'll start. I, I think that uh, a key that we've learned along the way is to have uh, multiple sectors at the table to really think about what are the solutions and uh, it, it's not it's not a solution that can be resolved by one sector such as government uh, but also the, the nonprofit sector I think it's coming together and thinking about how our how we can work together to leverage the resources that we have and need uh, potentially in new ways and and what that means for working together my observation has been that um, when when colleagues in government and policy have heard the stories from families and the impact of peer support, it's been very moving and important uh, information in terms of planning services and thinking about the integrations and the, the pathways between uh, the um, peer-based support and, and government supports and so forth. And I, I wonder if others want, want, would like to touch on that. It's such an important area. Lucy? Yeah, I, I think there's something, I've said this many, many, many times before, there's something that parents do for parents that no professional can do for them. There are things that parents can say to parents mm -hmm. professionals can't say. And there are things that parents know that professionals don't know. So these are not competing. These are complementary supports um, that, that parents need, quite frankly. I mean, the million dollar question, I suppose, is whether policymakers and governments can, can make this happen uh, can create, you know, deploy their resources, for example, in community services or community, sorry, in, in government services and social services, should they be deploying resources to be setting up uh, possibilities for parents to come together. But I think the person that actually could speak to this the best is Angela, quite frankly. Go ahead, Angela. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with everything David and Lucy just said. And I think that um, in David's summary, when he was talking just before he played the digital story, the, the nail that hit it right on the head is it's all about relationship. Um, you know, we can avoid systemic advocacy if we invest heavily in relationship. And when we talk about developing relationships with policymakers, um, a lot of things that happen at a policy level, um, when you avoid doing things at a policy level um, without inter interacting with parents directly, a lot of those things happen at an assumption level. Um, and so if we can talk about bringing parents to the table, parents' experience and parents' involvement in that 
that is such a rich relational um, conversation that is invested so heavily in those relationships that we're talking about. And so, um, and then when you bring it down to a ground level, it is so beneficial for um, professionals as well as parents to actually have peer support at the table because professionals don't have an emotional investment in the same way as parents do. And so when parents bring a peer support with them, professionals, that's a benefit to them because the peer support that is there um, is there for the professional as well. And I've often said um, to people, you know, when you get to bring a peer support, the peer support person might have a shared experience but they're not emotionally invested the same way the parent is. And the same thing can happen in policy development as well. So um, I absolutely believe that it is all about relationships in all of the different levels that Michelle spoke to in her presentation. Does any other member want to respond to that question? I would just reiterate what's been said. It's been really heartening to see in our three regions the coming together of the different sectors and, and areas uh, that have a stake in this area in the noble end of making it better for families in terms of navigating the system. And I, I think that's where the magic happens when we actually come to the table and have conversations together in meaningful ways. And, and, and what I've seen is the kind of the investment of, of all levels. So we talked about the families, but also service provider levels and different sectors like education and, and uh, financial services and, and government who, who have come to the table and deeply wanted to engage in those conversations. And we've seen examples of that and how important that is, is, incrementally moving forward and and uh, and and may it continue as, as we move this along and and it seems so integral to truly implementing change in a sustainable way I think everybody has echoed the importance of relationships and this question is is related um, and I'm hoping that people will recognize that, for navigation change to happen, relationships are key. But what other top lessons um, that families, service providers, and policymakers in other provinces across Canada should they take away from this project? You, you've all had such different and unique experiences. Are there things that other provinces would need to know from what you have done in your jurisdictions? I can certainly start um, the conversation about this. I'm sure others have lots to say. Um, one of the pieces that um, is, has discussions that I've had uh, with, with decision makers and policy makers is, is how, to, how to make decisions about, um, you know, what kinds of supports to deploy to, to, uh, to parents. And the emphasis is often on, you know, helping to build skills in individuals with or helping to solve, you know, behavioral dysregulation issues among those with neurodisabilities. Um, and those are important, don't get me wrong. Um, but the, the emphasis on, on, you know, helping parents to find, also find somebody for themselves to help them to move through these systems, the emphasis on these systems actually knowing each other and coming together and making those linkages so that parents can better navigate. I think those have been big takeaways for me. I think for me, an, an issue has been recalibrating the discussion. We often talk about services or we talk about quality of services or not enough services. But in, in this journey, I think some of our discussion has come to the places between services and um, thinking about how families navigate those. And, and sometimes we don't even have good language to speak to them, but that is often where families live, not in the mm -hmm. silos. They actually have to traverse all the silos. And so it's, how do we break those down? And so speak to that, that in-between space. And I, and I remember as an example in, in Alberta, families said, we don't wanna have to retell and retell our story. And I think 
what was beneath that, uh, there was many things, but one was that can we think about how those, those spaces in between services work together? So when I think about um, Dulce and Anton's example of how in, in, in BC, they, they navigated so that service, that place between services communicated more seamlessly and what that meant to families. That, that enters us into a new conversation, which I think is so important. And, and so but, and where that started for me was to hear from families saying, please don't make us tell that story again. Actually listen to what we're saying and address it in a way at a systems level. And I think for me, building on that, David, I think that's an excellent example when you talk about the between the systems or between the services. Um, you know, here in BC, again, um, for the Family Support Institute, when I talked in my presentation about peer support, a really big component of peer support is the emotional piece. Um, families connecting with families, part of that is the shared experience that no other model um, can speak to. You know, there are so many, like your diagram and your presentation, that really kind of messy dialogue of, or that messy diagram of one family's experience, it's all the professionals in one family's life. And which is a very much needed part of a family's journey. And so many professionals come from with so much compassion and so much integrity. But there's a piece missing in that um, with so much, much very good intention. The part missing is a shared emotional connection. And part of that that can come with peer support is a shared understanding of that grief or loss or um, that you can't find with somebody who doesn't have shared experience. And that would be my gift to another province is if you can create a peer support model and don't tie it up with red tape, don't tie it up with liability insurance, don't tie it up with rules and regulations, just allow it to be that is a gift you can give to families that will be unparalleled with anything else because families need that and they appreciate that. And that's what our organization has created and families really, really need it is that emotional support. Um, and, and you can't get that with professional to professional or professional to family and professionals. My advice to you is be humble in acknowledging it because you know, you can give so much, but you can't give that and it's okay. It's okay to just acknowledge it. Yeah. If I may add one, one thing that came to me in this presentation, but also in our work together, it, it's, it's the, a gift from the Yukon and, uh, and I didn't want us to miss this. And I, in that last presentation, the, um, in Watson Lake, a small community in the Yukon, they pivoted and in, a, in knowing their community and addressing a particular need at a particular time. And, and Wendy, you, you could speak to this so much better, but what I'm referring to is during COVID, the, the, the gap related to food security in the community. And, and I think the lesson for me is know your community, think deeply about what, what, what are the strengths? What are the challenges in your community? And that may lead us to where to start and, and to address those core needs. Um, and, and Angela, just as you said, listening to families, but also listening to your to community and really responding in, in a direct way. And, and that galvanizes communities and people at the table to then tackle the, the, the bigger challenge, the, the continual challenges of, of the navigational space. There was, um, in, in relation to thinking about community, and, and there was a question about the last graphic from the KBHN model asking, there was interest from quite a few people about whether or not that model is available to be accessed anywhere online. Yeah, I would say that we, we have a paper that is coming out. Uh, so that is in an, an academic space. Uh, that is very much hot off the press. So we will make that accessible. It isn't yet. But uh, it, thank you for that question, because I think that really encourages us to make that accessible quickly. 
Wonderful. And uh, I have a couple other quick questions. Um, there was a question related to curious what the difference is between the role of ACBC and an MCFD social worker. So for us at ACBC, we are um, an information and resource center. So we don't hold caseloads. Families are welcome to contact our, um, our toll free number. But I think similar to what David was saying, if a family's made a connection with one of our, our specialists, the reality is they usually will call back the same specialist just because that person has made that connection. Um, so CYSN or the MCFD social workers, they hold caseloads. So they actually have children um, and families assigned to them. And with us, you can contact any one of our, um, our staff at any time. Thank you for that clarification, Dulcie. Yeah. There was another question. Uh, people are interested in how they can find out more information about the summit, uh, your provincial efforts uh, in January. So, do you want me to speak to that, Anton, or do you want do you want do you want to take it, or Dulce? There's a few of us on here. Do you want to start, Angela? And sure, yeah. So we have a, a first summit, which is coming um, in January, um, and it is for it, it is by invitation only, um, and it's going to be relatively small. I think we have, I think we decided on, I think it's about a hundred and some odd organizations that have they're they're coordinated into different categories education health family led organizations um, government um, and then it will lead into another subsequent summit that we're hoping will be a little bit larger um, and the summits will um, be growing into what we want to, to call a community of practice um, and so it's our first one um, and we're going to be hopefully defining what is navigation, best practice in navigation, learning what people do in their organizations around navigation. And one of the things that we will, and very quickly I'll just say, we know that there are some people who do navigation, we know that there are some people who think they do navigation, and there are some people who do navigation just off the corner of their desk, but they're not really supposed to be doing navigation. And so this is first summit is one of our places where we're going to just figure out what's going on with navigation and set some things around guiding principles around that. I think that might not be the right language, but we're just going to kind of set the landscape and then starting to move towards the next summit where we'll hopefully be able to create that um, broader engagement around that. Maybe you might want to speak a bit more to it. And it's all going to also um, be guided in research as well around that as well. You want to speak a bit more to it, Anton? Yeah, just briefly, I agree with what you're saying, Angela, that it would be an opportunity to initially bring people together to help define what we're all talking about because people do use different terms to define this range of activities uh, to learn from each other, but also to sort of look to the future and think what's, what's happening now, but what is possible? Are people willing to come together and look at different ways of uh, working together of, of, of visualizing the landscape for navigation. So in some ways, it's not a typical conference where you have expert speakers getting up and sharing their knowledge. It's a, an opportunity, in my view, for people to, uh, who are kind of very invested in the area, both people doing navigation primarily as their, their primary work, people who are doing it off the side of their desk, and the families who are affected by navigational efforts to come together and really see can we uh, contemplate doing things in a different kind of way and, and being more integrated? So that's what, so the initial summit would be not so much a big public event where people learn a lot of new facts, but a sort of groundswell of trying to bring people together to talk to each other and relate to each other and see what's possible. Thank you for that, Anton, and I, I so appreciate that idea of groundswell and bringing people together and relationships. Um, and I think we are almost out of time. I would really like to thank all of you out there in the, in the world that I can't see uh, for 
for being a part of our presentation. I would like to thank our presenters. I know that you have dedicated your time and commitment to sharing your learnings uh, with everybody who has um, been able to take part in this today. And I really want to, and I know this, I'm speaking for our entire team when I say I really want to thank Anthony and his team for helping us with our recordings and presentations today. I know as a group, we may have been a little anxious, myself probably at the top of the, of the pile, um, in terms of just how this would work. And um, you've really helped us figure out how to do this. Um, and again, our team is in the Yukon, in British Columbia, and McGill, and here in Alberta. So many thanks. And one more thank you, and that is to our funders. We would mm. not be able to have had these conversations. We would, the, the funding has been an, an absolute catalyst for this work. And we're extre so we're extremely grateful to KBHN, to the foundation, to our donors for um, allowing us to engage in this really important work. Thank you.